you know, it would be just all the sick tonight just out there on the airways and so on. We, Lord, we know, God, that there's nothing impossible with you. We trust in you. We ask you, Lord, to just watch over them, give them peace of mind, and help them in their trying times right now. God, uh, I just praise, praise you and thank you, Lord, for each and every one that's here tonight. God, just be with everyone in their testimonies and their songs. And Lord, in your word tonight, we know, God, we're so thankful we have a good pastor here. Amen. God, that preaches the word. And God, you know his heart. We just praise Amen. you and thankful for, for his wife who uh, helped him along with this ministry. So God, just be with each and everything that's said and done tonight. And may you receive the honor, praise, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is true. Page 83 for the first selection. Seating, page 83. Start our song service with page three nine zero for the next selection. Three nine zero. And I think this is a favorite of one of those folks out there <laughs> on the internet this evening. Sister Pat always loved to hear this song, and also Brother Roy. Brother Roy, he was here, loved this song. There's power in the blood.
Request to give to a Jim Montgomery. Those two folks that came to know Jim, I don't know about his soul. That's between him and the Lord. Mm -hmm. I do know he's in the Lord's hands. And whatever the Lord has for him, we hope and pray that uh, it uh, help, help that family through this uh, difficult time. Also, one of my neighbors, uh, Keith Kelly, is mine. She passed away. And uh, just remember them. Amen. Remember those folks that see had a good talk.
only thing he could find is she was really anemic. And, uh, but other than that, he said her ultimate was real good, and so just keep her in prayer. Looking forward to seeing Sue expecting it. Amen. 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 Someone else. Before I got a praise report or a, you want to cry on my shoulder, whatever. <laughs> I uh, finally broke down and decided I'd call the doctor to see something about my throat. Well, I hadn't been to my family doctor for several years. So you know what happens after three years? They kick you out the back door. <laughs> they really don't need you anymore. Uh -huh. So I had to go through the process of getting another doctor. And he's going to look at me on, on Monday about 1.30. I just asked the, the, the church and the Lord, just to be that situation. I don't, you know, if whatever happens, happens, and folks, I, you know, but I, uh, I, uh, I went through the VA, and uh, they done what they could do. They said, you better get your face up. So we'll just, we'll just see what the Lord has in hand. Remember me on Monday, and I'll be back, okay? Someone else this evening. Someone else. J.D.'s back there on the soundboard this evening. J.D., can you ask God's blessing? Please. Lord bless and how the Father come to you tonight. And Lord, just ask you to remember everything that was brought up, Lord. And Lord, just remember the shut ins, the ones that couldn't be here for whatever reason, Lord. And remember all the families that's lost to this uh, this terrible disease, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, JD. Page 382 for the next election. Seeing our sisters chosen. Page 382. Last mile away.
still true, aren't you? When I recall my last mile away, we don't know what might happen to us before we get out the door. Amen. No matter what, we've got a Savior that will take us home to heaven. I hear that Jan's going to sing for us this evening. And I hear Jim and Jenny's going to sing for us this evening. They would do that in church for anybody. They must be listening to God. Maybe while some, while someone's coming to sing this evening, someone with a word of praise for our Heavenly Father. Thanks, my praise the Lord. Amen, sister. Some parts were a little high for me, and so where it goes up, I go down, so <laughs> bear with me.
morning. Thank you very much. There's two girls sitting back here on the back row. Because <laughs> I'll sing for us too, seeing if God has told you to. Charlie, I don't have a song, but I, I do want to thank the Lord for uh, for all that he's done for me. Amen. Um, I had a checkup at the doctor this morning, and um, they spread them out. And I think this one was like six months from the last one to my, my endocrinologist and my thyroid. And uh, she called me up to the window, and she acted like she's having trouble finding me. And they know me. They don't have to ask my date of birth and all this formally. And she asked my date of birth, and I thought, oh, have I got the wrong day? What's wrong? come to find out somebody back in August somehow got in and canceled my appointment and marked me deceased. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I said, oh, well, um, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> so, you know, long story short, they, they got me in. I had to wait a little longer. But, you know, I got to think about it. I thought, how easy is it that they just, you just get marked off? Yeah. And, you know, I'm thankful that if whatever happens, whenever that time comes, then I'm ready to go. Yeah, that, you know, when it, when it comes and I pop up on their system in that way, that I know where I'm going to be. And um, I'm thankful that, you know, I do feel really good for a <laughs> deceased woman. So, so far, so good. God's been good. And I'm, you know, my checkup was good. And I'm just thankful that he's watched over me all these years. Amen. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Here I thought I was bad. They just... You know, so my name is like, yeah. so you can read yeah. well, That's not good. But still, that's just that's modern things today. I mean, man, you know, post it, post it, but you know, won't be released. Someone else with a song this evening? Okay. Anybody? <laughs> Angie's going to come and sing to us. She had to go back to work yesterday, and she says she's alive two days, so that's a miracle to sell, I guess, huh? But unless you're right.
certainly seen it. You need that evidence. If not, I know a man will bring us the word so you let his words come. playing when I've gone the last mile of the way and if you noticed I turned around and looked at Teresa and she probably thought I was telling her she was singing off key or something <laughs> she looked at me and she said what <laughs> but what I wanted her to look at was Miss Conley's playing with one hand she had the other hand up in the air praising God so, <laughs> you know what that reminded me of Sister Barb that reminded me of uh, uh, when they're rebuilding the wall so they're here working but they also got the sword ready to yeah, use. So. Yeah. God's good to us, isn't he? Amen. Chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, chapter 5. There's some scriptures that I preach from that it doesn't matter how often you go back to it, you still can't get it all out and, and if you get the same thing out you got out the last time those people that write everything down if you wrote everything down and you got everything out the same it would still be something different yeah. <laughs> it still would be it would be a different crowd of people that would be receiving it maybe different hearts uh, in those people than what was there the last time but God is sure good I've had to pray through the day that God would uh, help me uh, to I remember, and I won't mention his name, but you would know him if I did mention uh, his name. He's passed on now, but an older minister said to me one time, he said, there was, a, there was a time in my ministry as a pastor I became angry. And uh, he said, uh, I would shear the sheep more than I would feed them. And he was leaving that for me. I was sitting in his home talking with him. Uh, he was unable to preach at this time and had four messages ready to preach. I mean, he was writing them down. And I don't know if he left them to some of his buddies, but some of his buddies don't live too far from here, so maybe he did. But, but he said, God forgave me of that. He said, but I'll just advise you. He said, you just be careful. He said, sometimes things happen, things don't go the way you want them to in a church. And, and he, said it just, he said it was just wearing on possibly maybe I should have left before I did and he was just kind of pouring out his heart to me and I and I can tell you one thing I don't know that I've ever been mean to people and cheered the sheep like that but I can tell you one thing I have uh, early in my um, in my time preaching um, had to deal with pride that's one thing you say you had to deal with pride well you get to be proud of well <laughs> I've told every young minister that I've ever talked to after that uh, my prayer would be that you would go through that and it wouldn't destroy you, but if you went through it, that you would realize that it's never you, it's always him. If there's anything good comes from you preaching, it's him. Right. Because if you look, in this, and it's always been this way, not especially today in our day and time, but I think it's always been this way. I never was interested in preaching when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, but I knew that there were certain I labeled them as a teenager. My dad probably would not have liked it if he had known that, but certain antics that preachers would use, and there were certain styles, and if they beat the pulpit at the right place, if they cried at the right place, if they screamed out nothing but the King James Bible at the right place, you know, you could get the, it was like a, a feeding frenzy for sharks, you know, just throwing out the uh, the chum to them. But, and, and so I, I would watch that. And when I started preaching myself, and maybe I did myself no favors, but I just kind of figured that, you know, if you're going to preach, you hacked and you hollered and you screamed and you sweated and you, and I got the sweating part down for sure. <laughs> and, and so after a while, I began to pray, God, just let me sing. I can sing. God, just let me sing. I, I can't do this preaching thing. And I remember finally saying, God, just I'm just going to try to be who I am. And being 
and who I am has taught me a lot of a lot of things. Of course, uh, uh, it doesn't you don't always fit in with the in crowd. Um, one year I preached six revivals, I think it was. In one year I said, all the good preachers must be sick. Something is wrong. <laughs> I'm a pastor, I'm, and I'm preaching six revivals. What in the world's wrong there? But today I found myself praying, God, help me. If I can show anything to anybody, help me show love and grace and mercy. Mm -hmm. And It's what the world needs, and... And if they don't choose to take it, we're all going to die someday. If they don't choose to take it, they're going to stand before God just like I am. Brother Jim said to somebody he invited to church, he said, they have been invited. They've been asked. Yeah. Sometimes we do our job and we just have to back away from it. We do our job. You know, uh, this, was, this was early religion that they claimed Christianity. And you can think whatever you want to, but when you read church history, you will see and, when it, and when, if you notice, when it said church history, it usually means the Roman Catholic Church. That's church history usually coming up. You start seeing Saint this, Saint that, and those are all in history books. Well, if you read, there's a lot of times where if people didn't line up to what they wanted, man, they wanted to beat people, kill people, run people off, and, and, uh, and people today, you still, as a follower of Christ, you get the bad name of, well, look what the Christians did years ago. They killed people. They did this. They did that. And I'm thinking, well, maybe they did, but were they really followers of Christ? Or were they followers of the church? Um, and so it's something tonight I'm going to read to you from the Beatitudes just a little here. And, uh, and hopefully this will give us a description of the follower of Jesus. And so I would say to you tonight that this book is your mirror. So get it out and look into it tonight because uh, uh, if you don't see what you want to see, and it's been said, a man that looks in a mirror and sees he's got dirt on his face and expects the mirror to wipe the dirt off is a fool. It won't. You've got to do that. But if you look into the Word of God and God shows you something tonight, then you use it uh, to get in line, as the old song says, right? Is that it? Get in line, brother, if you want to go home. So chapter 5 of the book of Matthew. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set... His disciples came unto him. <clears throat> I'm not going to knock anybody, but listen, Jesus did his preaching most of it sitting down. He'd read the text, even when he was in the, in the temple, in the synagogue, he'd read the text, and then when he was seated, then he began to get, and that's what they did. So styles, and people get so wrapped up in, oh, you man, you ought to have heard this one, and man, he can really preach. And, and it's all, to me, substance. It's not what they're doing, how they're doing it, but it's the substance that should be there. But anyhow, Jesus sat down, and his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And you could say blessed. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake. And notice that word falsely. <laughs> if, if they do it, if men persecute you and revile you, and they say all manner of evil against you, and they have a real reason to do that, then that's probably on your head. But if they do it falsely, for his sake, it says rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I did, have, I did have a stopping point, but I am going to read a little bit more to you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden underfoot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, or put put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And still, even that's a hard place to stop. But I am going to stop there um, unless I feel like I need to read some more. But I'm just going to stop there uh, for now. And so we see up until that a verse that Jesus just keeps bringing it out. He keeps giving the word. The disciples could have left. We could have left there and said, man, was he shucking the corn tonight. Man, was he preaching tonight. Why was he loud? Well, he probably had to be loud. They didn't have a public announcement system. They didn't have the PA. They didn't have a mic, wireless, a lapel, and stick it on him. And so he probably, but he's on a mountain. And so uh, scholars would say, not that they know any more than you and I sometimes, but they would say probably uh, the mountain range was able to project a little bit uh, of what he was saying. So was he loud? He could have been. Did he kick off his sandals and run down the aisles? Probably not. Um, did he get all sweaty? Probably not. Some people would say to you then, he wasn't preaching. If you like Charles Stanley, if you like David Jeremiah, I know people who uh, despise that style of preaching. And I think to myself, what is wrong with you? All that does to me is just show me how uh, feebly minded you may be if you think that just because that guy standing up there is what you would consider to be. And I can say, God, I prayed about this today. I don't want to be mean, but this just goes. And it's going out there too, not just in here. So wherever it goes, I'm just saying I'm, this is... A little bit of a soapbox maybe, but this is just what I feel like saying tonight. It is not just the style of the person that's delivering the message. So a teacher, preacher, whatever you want to call that man, if God has called him and you haven't, back away from him and take the word. As long as he's not giving you something false, if it's God's word, take it. In the last day, you're going to be judged for what you do with God's word, and he's going to be judged for how he put it out there. I remember years ago hearing Calvary Evans say this. He was talking about pastors who were afraid to let anybody else in their pulpit. And he said, you know, we travel a lot. And he said, to travel, you have to have people fill the pulpit. He said, if I was so afraid that I left the pulpit and one of the guys that I had come in could mess up everything that God had started while I was there, he said, then I probably haven't started very much. <laughs> and so... It is what it is. However you like the preaching, some people, some people like it. Now, I know since I've been here, I've had people say to me since I've been here, in this building and out of this building, there are certain styles of preaching they didn't like. If they didn't like my style, you could bet on it. They probably ain't here tonight. <laughs> they probably look for something else. No one told me that, but um, who would? Sometimes people would. I remember a little woman that told me once when we were leaving to go to Myrtle Beach to move there, and she said, I really hate to see you go. And she's still living. She's close to 90, probably now. She says, uh, uh, the first time, I remember the first time I ever heard you preach, she said, I even wondered if you were tall. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't surprise me. I mean, you could read her like an open book, you know? And I mean, it, it, it was one of those things that when I would preach, I usually didn't want to look at her because I already knew what she was thinking. <laughs> Sometimes I was like, uh, I would stand in the foyer as a young pastor and think, somebody throw me a bone here. Somebody let me know at least you're getting something. And then I got on a little bit, and I'd just stay up front. I was like, you just do your thing. If you liked it, you did. If you didn't, you didn't. But if you didn't, take it up with God. If I'm doing everything I can do, there it is. And so anyhow, Jesus keeps giving it to these guys. And one verse at a time is like a pearl. And he just keeps stringing it on the strand. I mean, he just, he's making something beautiful here if we will apply it to our lives. But is it that we apply this to our life to make us what he wants us to be? Or is it that this is what comes out of us because we are already what he wants us to be? And that's a question I have for all of us tonight. And am I looked at as a child of God because I am a peacemaker? Or am I a peacemaker because I am a child of God? If you, if you look at this, it would be almost like, I could almost say, you know, if I dress the part, 
I will be a Christian. Or how about if I'm a Christian, I will dress the part. I'm not picking on people's dress and, and dress code, but what I'm saying is, for years I was raised in church, and for years people knocked so much about how people look, and there are still things that I would think are very inappropriate and should never be worn in a church house. But it's more than just what we have on the outside, but it's what is on the inside. And that's what's going to shine forth. God already sees it, so we don't have to shine it forth to him. We have to say, hey, look here, God. It doesn't matter if it's cloudy, if it's dark. It doesn't matter. God already sees it. But who are we trying to show it? If we are the salt and the light, then when we're doing our good deeds before men and they're seeing that, they will praise God. But you've got to be true behind closed doors, just like you are in the pulpit, behind the piano, behind the bass, the guitar, um, being the janitor, running the sound, and sitting in the pew. It's our call Amen. to receive the Spirit of the Lord within us, and then Jesus says, we will come and we will make our abode in you. And so the difference is there. And I'll tell you something that uh, I think is fantastic for all of us to do is to start our day with prayer. And Brother Suter Hoople used to say, if we would start our day saying, God, please keep me from something that would bring reproach or shame, we wouldn't have to pray at night, God, please forgive me for something that I said or did. Yeah. And, and quite possibly, years ago, do you remember Cedarville Bible College, which is, of course, still there. It's a pretty big Bible college, I think. I think uh, David Jeremiah probably, I think, graduated from there before he went on to California, where he's at now. But anyhow... That Bible college had CDR radio back in the 90s, and I loved it. I, I wasn't a real big fan of some of their music, but the preaching and stuff, I just loved to listen to it. And, um, and I know there are other stations today that you can listen to, but that one, I, was just, I just liked it. I liked the lineup of preachers and all that stuff. And listening to that one day, I heard a man preaching about having an intentional relationship with God, that everything I did was intentional, and it should be, that when I get up in the mornings, I don't just say my hair probably looks all right and just leave without fixing it, or my breath probably is all right, so I'm not going to brush my teeth, or it doesn't matter if I wear sandals and socks to work, I'm a chaplain, they won't care. But what is intentional is to get up, look in the mirror, when the hair's sticking up like alfalfa, to fix it a little bit, to brush the teeth, and to look presentable for my job. So that would be intentional for me to live and do what I'm doing in the physical. It should be the same way for us as Christians to be intentional, that I won't go out intentionally desiring to hurt somebody or to inflict pain on somebody that I won't be abusive to people, that I won't be coarse with people. You want to know what my nature is? <laughs> I don't know. You could, maybe you know me well enough by now to know, and you may say you have a pretty good handle on it. Well, you don't know how hard I work at it. <laughs> Somebody says, you must really give God a workout. <laughs> if you've ever been chastised by God, you know that you just better just get in line. He doesn't chastise anybody that isn't his. But trust me, I don't get out of line just so I can get a whipping and make sure I'm still his. I mean, I know I'm his, and so I'm just trying to keep on walking the way he'd have me to. But to, but to, be, but to be of the old nature. I had Butch Cooper come here and preach one time, and, and I don't know if you all remember him. We started our Saturday night revivals, and he may have been the first one that I had to come, but he came and preached, and he pastors a church up in Ray, Ohio, and uh, a couple of the preacher friends, uh, we went up to his church one night to visit, and he was preaching, and he is one of those uh, pounding and hunting. I mean, we got a brand new pulpit over at Lombardville when I pastored there, brand new pulpit, uh, everything there, you know, you could raise the little thing up and down where you put your Bible up and down. It was held by little plastic pins. He comes in, he starts preaching, bang, 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 <laughs> broke it. <laughs> So he had to put wooden dowel pins in to hold it up. He's just that type of preacher, you know, just banging and stomping and snorting, and, and, uh, and he is. You could ask him. He is. I'm proud of it. Nothing wrong with that. But I remember him saying one night, if the old man isn't dead, 
and do whatever you got to do to kill him. Take a hammer and beat him in the head, but get rid of him. What he was talking about was the old nature. And so when Jesus starts with blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are they that mourn, and blessed are the meek, and blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I have to stop and look in those six verses. I'm wondering, and I'm not the judge, because, but I fit right in. How much does the church of Jesus Christ today, the followers of Christ, the description of the follower of Jesus, how much do we hunger and thirst after righteousness? Right. If we can be filled, there's nothing stopping us from being filled. I mean, if you looked at it from a physical perspective, some people survive and they live to eat. Some people eat to live. <laughs> I, I've been both. I've almost been both at one time. At the point where I tip the scale and then, there you go. I can sit down and be really hungry. And I've found that the best time for me to eat is when I haven't eaten two hours previous. You know why? I appreciate it more. It tastes better. It just There's just something about it that meal for me to say to get up from the table or say oh I'm stuck wouldn't it be great if we as followers of Christ could leave the church now you can blame it on me if you want to and I'm going to take the blame till I die folks so if it's me you can blame it on me but if it's you you could leave this church and find another one and then you'd have to blame it on that man or whoever that is too because if it is you it's you it's not me. I remember the first church we pastored, my Aunt Nancy said to me, who was our pastor's wife, my uncle Dave was the pastor of the church there, and we were attending there, and we went to pastor this church, and I said, my biggest fear is, this is the first church I pastored, my biggest fear is how I'm going to preach to older folks who are older than me, who've read the Bible more than me, how am I going to feed them? And she said, if they want to eat, they will eat. Yeah. No matter and he said, don't let older people fool you. Most of them ain't read the Bible anyhow. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> and maybe, that's not, maybe that was an in general statement, but he made it anyhow. That was his opinion, his idea. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Have you ever been thirsty? I don't know. I'm, I, I take medication that makes me dry as can be. And I'm probably because... Sherry, did you leave anything down here? Is there water in there? You will probably, I won't say never because you saw it here a while back I had to, but I just, I don't do that. I would watch guys, I'd watch them old regular Baptists, they'd be preaching and going on, they'd take that glass and they'd get them and pour them and I would think, I ain't doing that. I'm not doing that. And somebody said, well, you don't have to do that because you just stay in there. Well, I get so dry sometimes. If you're really thirsty, what do you want? Now, some people say there's nothing that satisfies but water. And that's good for you, maybe. I like Diet Coke, ice cold. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, it doesn't, some, it doesn't always have to be water for me. But when you're thirsty, you know how it is. You just need something. I'd say there's a big part of the church world that's thirsty and hungry. They haven't come to eat or to drink. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you make them. You know the saying that people throw around. It could be bumper stickers, I guess. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Mm -hmm. I never dealt with horses. But if you knew a guy named George Lou, now my grandfather's name was George Lou, but this is a different George. This is George the Preacher from years ago. And probably in 1978 or so, he said to my dad, sitting in the service, somebody said, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And George Luke leaned over and said to my dad, if you salt him enough, he'll drink. I don't know. I don't deal with horses. I don't know. But man, are we dry. Man, are we get dry. And feeble. Weak. You know what happens if you don't eat, if you don't drink? You can go longer. You 
go longer. Some people say, well, how long can you go? How long can you go without food? How long can you go without water? Spiritually, why would you ever want to find out? So blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. When you see somebody that needs help, and maybe you can't help them, but whether you could or whether you couldn't, you just didn't have the mercy to do it, then that's your problem. That's not always theirs. God will send someone to help them. If they truly have a need, God will send someone to help them. But maybe God was trying to teach you a lesson. Maybe it was you wasn't merciful. So one day maybe that will come back on you. But then this one here and the next one. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. How many of you in here tonight want to see God? The Old Testament says no man has seen God and lived. But we're going to one day. How are we going to do that? Blessed are the pure in heart. How are we going to be pure in heart? We are going to receive what God has for us, and it is going to change us. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Do you remember a man in um, the Old Testament named Nabal? If you were to look, and let me just read a piece of scripture to you. I'll take you to 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel, David and his men, they're hungry, they're thirsty. And David hears of a man who's shearing his sheep. And uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, he hears of this man that's shearing his sheep. And so he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send some men over and say, can you supply us something for my men, for David's men? And scripture says in verse 2 of chapter 25, and there was a man in, in man whose possessions were in carnal, and the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in carnal. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. And so we get the word. David sends his men. His men go down. His men say just what David says. In verse 9, And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David, and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those things. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out to the wilderness to salute our master. And he railed on him. If he, if he would have had the guts and wouldn't have been afraid, he might have said, And you know how your husband is. You know what he did. You know what he said. And she wasn't hearing anything she didn't already know, I'm sure. But the men were very good unto us. We were not hurt. Neither missed we anything as long as we were uh, conversant with them when we were in the fields. And they were a wall unto us, both by night and by day, all the while. We were with, we were, uh, with them keeping the sheep. And so what he's explaining to Abigail is, to this servant is, they were good for us. They helped us. They protected us. And your husband treated them like dirt. And what's Abigail do? The scripture says in verse 18, she made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine 
and five sheep ready dressed, and five measures of parched corn, and a hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cake of figs, and laid them on the asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. You know what she's doing? Sparing his life. You know what David's going to do? He's going to kill him. He's hot. Now, I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> I'm going to read. I'll just tell you. Nabal dies, not at the hand of David. And David takes Abigail, Nabal's wife, to wife. And more wives than one at that time. Apparently one wasn't enough, so... He took her too, right? But anyhow, so I won't read you any more of that, but I will say to you today, living in the New Testament, I just preached on peace not long ago. Blessed are the peacemakers here today in 2021. Blessed are the peacemakers. Can you always be a peacemaker? I think God knows our hearts anyhow, sees our hearts, whether the people really look at it as you're doing what is right or not. But David was looking to go out there and probably take this man's life, or at least give him a good thrashing for what he had done, for how he had treated his men. You could say, that's not peacemaking. Of these two fellows, which one of them would you look at and say, this man's a man of God and this man over here? I mean, I don't think if you look at Nabal, I don't think you're seeing very much of a representation of God at all. And somebody may say, well, he wasn't supposed to be. How about King Saul? King Saul was at one time. And he stepped out of line. That's Old Testament scripture. He said, Brother George, you can't do that in the New Testament. Can I tell you how many times, if I were to print off things that have been said by people that I have attended church with for the last 30 years that I have known personally and even sat in their homes, and if I could print off some of the things that I have read off of uh, social media in the last month of these people who are followers of Christ, but man, they sure don't look like it. And I'm talking both parties. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me, but I'm looking at this thinking to myself, does this look like what Jesus said for us to live like? No. Am I going to say, come to charity, free will Baptist? I've hated about everything you've stood for for the last so many years, but come on! If you're going to, then. We should talk about a separation. These people don't want to be around. It's like these people. Who wanted to be around Nabal? Who wanted to be around Saul when the evil spirit came upon him and he was looking to kill David? Nobody wanted to be around him. They wouldn't look at him and say, there's a true man of God. Now, some of the people may have because they may have been afraid that Saul, still being king, had the power to kill them. But here he was even trying to take David's life. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So I've pastored long enough to know that when you have troublemakers in the church, and get this clear, we don't have any here in this church. Jesus, well, other than my wife. No, right? Are you clapping over there tonight? <laughs> no, she says. But sometimes, some, even, even Christians sometimes get under each other's skin. Yeah. You know the old saying is, uh, you don't have to like them, you just have to love them. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what, there are sometimes people that I ain't real fond of. And I love them. I want to be at their house eating dinner. I don't want to be talking with them. I probably don't want to see them at Walmart talk to them. If all they're going to talk about is rah, 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 rah. blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We got enough troublemakers. What would it say? What would it look like if I came out belligerent, mean, pushy? Oh, you know, people that that's the only kind of preaching they like. If it ain't mean and rough and hard, they don't want to be around. Think that's it. Give it to them. Thinking, we need to give it to them. You need to take some of it too. I can stomach hard preaching as long as it's honest, sincere, coming from God, hard preaching. But if it's just because something has happened that I don't like, 
I need to be pretty careful about how I present that. And that gentleman that told me that day had pastored for 50 years. When he told me that there was a period in his life where he got mean from the pulpit, you know what that tells me? And I always think this. We didn't agree with the Pentecostal Free Will Baptist in Myrtle Beach when we started pastoring the Little River. We knew. Once we found out what the title of that church was, I'm like, okay, Free Will Baptist, I got. The Pentecostal, I understand Pentecost 50 days. I understand all that stuff, but I don't know if I'll see it the way you see it. And so I went to a board meeting with eight members of the Pentecostal Free Will Baptist. And any of them watch this tonight, God bless you, brothers. I love you. Nothing against you. But as we sat there, the youngest one was probably, at this time, I was 50. And the youngest one was probably 48. And the oldest one was 80. And as they sat around this table interviewing me to see if I could preach and take care of their church that had five people. Five people. My heart's desire, and Teresa's as well, had been for two years at least to be at that church. I mean, it's just a draw to it. And then when it happened, there we are now sitting in this room of this organization, this denomination, talking to these men. They said, can you tell us what you maybe wouldn't see eye to eye on? And I said, well, I don't really know everything that you will. We can give you stuff you can read. And I said, well, here's how I know. And so I started saying some things. And I said, but I will tell you this. I will answer to you because you are over that church. I said, but I will only answer to you because I know I answered to God first. And I said, you got five people there, and if the church grows, I will not hurt your people intentionally. They are God's sheep, and I'm not going to come in and browbeat them because not only would I have to answer to you, but I will have to answer to God, and I'm not going to get myself in trouble with him. And I pray that I remain that way until I ever stop preaching or die. Because it's a rough thing when we see, and especially in the society we live in today, we are supposed to be loved. Now, what does Jesus say? On down, I didn't read, but on down, I could read to you right there in the same words where he's talking to his disciples. He says, I did not come to, do, to, to, uh, to stop the law, but I came to fulfill the law. I didn't come to do away with it, but I came to fulfill it. So if it was wrong, it was wrong. But he had a way of talking to people, of teaching people, of helping people. I would venture to say that the majority of the church world today would have stoned the woman brought in the very act of adultery. They would have killed her. In 2021, I'm talking. If, if they could have, they would have stoned her. And what did Jesus do? We know the story as he wrote and then he said to her, go on out and live like you used to. No, he didn't. He said, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. But everything he did, he did it with love. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say tonight is this. Because I know that there, there are people that, there, there, I know people that are just battling them. How, how do we handle, how do we... How do we go on? What do we do? And somebody said they're so scared to death of living in the United States. And I'm thinking, it's going to get worse. But if you're this scared of living here, try living somewhere else where it already is worse. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. You just live how you live. Be a peacemaker. You don't have to give in. If it's wrong, it's wrong. If God's word says it's wrong, it's wrong. But you will never make people see it your way if all you do is put your foot on their throat and hold them down. And how foolish are we to ever think that they will see it our way if we come at them like Nabal came at David's men and said, Who in the world is David? Who is Jesse? And so blessed are the peacemakers. Does that mean we should be, Dennis Osborne used to say, Jesus was meek. But it didn't mean he was weak. And he was not a floor mat for you to wipe your feet on. He did what he did. And he did it how he had to do it. But he was love. And when he did it with love, there's nobody that could look. I know. I, I was telling uh, Brother Jimmy, Brad Harris is, 
uh, coming from Pennsylvania and he's going to be here. And Saturday night he's going to bring his banjo or Sunday night rather for our 6 o'clock service. I tried to get him to preach. He wants to hear me preach. I don't know if he really wants to hear me preach, but he just, he didn't want to do it, right? So anyhow, I'm going to preach. He said, I'll bring my banjo and we'll play and sing some and, and let me listen to you preach. And I said, okay, if you can watch that man, and hopefully you won't even see this because I know he would just shoot it down right now. But you want to see someone who could, someone could point and say, blessed are the peacemakers. I'll work with that man. We worked together as hospice chaplain. He was my assistant pastor for a while, played banjo with me for 18 years, to stand beside him, to drive with him, to do funerals with him, to be with him, to know I didn't ever live with him. <laughs> Knew him before he was married, known him after. Known him before kids, known him after. Um, but just, just to see him was somebody that just exemplified blessed are the peacemakers. Some of us have to work on it a little bit harder. You know what I'm going to say to you tonight then? Get to work. Work on it. It's no, no one ever said it was going to be real easy. People are going to do things to you you don't like. And so what are you going to do? Show yourself. Make a spectacle of yourself. Make a spectacle of your church. Divide people. Run people out. Run people off. Have people pass this church and say... You know, tonight we pulled in, and I told Teresa, and, and there's not anything against anybody. There wasn't, there wasn't anybody here yet, so that's why it hadn't happened yet. But uh, the little gate thing, the little chain thing was locked out there and has the sign just saying, don't drive in this way, dummy. <laughs> so anyhow, I went over, and I unhooked it, and I just looked at Teresa, and I said, I just, even though it's dark, I said, I just don't think it looks good on our church for us to have that thing locked. And, and like I said, it's nobody's fault because we don't have a lock during service. It always is. But when I got here, I wanted to unlock it because I thought, wouldn't it be sad if we just left it? There ain't going to be nobody here tonight, anyhow. Only normal people. All you all normal people, right? All you normal people know to come around. We don't want anybody else coming that's going to come in that way because they don't know you shouldn't come in that way, right? And I'm like, tear it down. Move it out of the way. Bring them in. Let them come in. What if people drove by this church and said, man, them people over there are the most hateful people. <laughs> okay, work on it. If you are, if you have been, one of our brothers here a while back said something that he didn't have to say, and he said it from right up here, and he said it out, and he said, if I've ever done anything, it takes a lot of guts to do that. It's not a false humility. For you and I both, we need to be peacemakers. I like to get people to come in this church and hear the word of God, but if they don't like me because I've already ran them down, I've already told them what I thought of them, they ain't going to show up. I'll be quite honest with you. They're preachers I wouldn't walk across the street to listen to tonight. And I've been friends with them for years. But I ain't crazy about their attitude just not crazy about their attitude. They don't treat people right. And if you ain't going to treat people right, I'm just thinking, okay, you can, you can teach any old monkey how to preach, but Amen. something's wrong in your heart. Amen. Okay. I said I was trying not to get too much in myself, so I better leave that there. But anyhow, God is good to us, right? Yeah. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? The sky is falling. When the sky falls, he takes us up beyond it. That's all we're going to do. We're just going to go be with him someday. But we ain't there yet. Let's stand tonight. Maybe you're here with a need. Maybe you'd like to pray. Lord, I thank you for the day you've given us. God, I thank you for the opportunity to look into your word, Lord, to know that we know that you see us. You see the intent of our heart. see the very thoughts that are in our head. We could try to cover things up afterwards, after the fact, and try to make things look better and try to make things look as if it wasn't how it appeared. But, God, we know you already know and you already see. So, God, I pray today that you would help us to intentionally live the best life we can live for you. When we know that there are things that we don't agree with and that we don't like, God, I pray that you will put a lock on our lips until it is time for us to speak. Help us to be the people of peace 
not the people that are ran over, not the people that are ran down. We understand that no matter how anybody else looks at things, they will answer one day for their thought process, as will we. But these are words that come from our Savior. And we read these words, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I want to be called a child of God. I'm sure the people in this church do, and I'm sure the people that are watching this and will watch it tonight want to be called children of God, but not just for the sake of being called that. We want to be that whether anybody recognizes it or not. But we are salt and light. And I understand the people right there may say, but yes, George, we've got to do this. I didn't say we didn't. I just said, Lord, we have to do it in love. Just like Jesus, he did not condone the woman's sin. He said, go and sin no more. But he was the only one that had the authority to put her to death, and he did not. God, I pray that you will help us. How do we rationalize that? From Old Testament to New Testament. Then we read Jesus' words. He didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. All the things that I read in the, in the New Testament that I see that would bring condemnation to me, Jesus says, has Paul pinned down in Romans that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, an intentional searching for your ways, seeking a closer walk with you. Not just saying, God, I need one and, and drop a bolt of lightning down through a service when a preacher is jumping and running and shouting and in a revival and knock me down and give me more of the Spirit, but an intentional, God, I need more of you. Help us to be the peacemakers. Help us to be the merciful. Help us to be those that hunger and thirst in our field because we have came to receive what you have to offer. Whether it's a Wednesday night, a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, or a midday week, or a Saturday, it doesn't matter, God. Help us, whatever our position is, or lack of it in the church, God, help us to have a greater desire to be closer to you. Not just so the people around us can see. But if it's so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face, and we're supposed to be the light, and we're not shining bright enough that they can even see where they're going about to walk off a ledge. We need to have the light to let them see that. God, it starts. It's got to start with love. We've got to love people. Allow them to see that you care for them and we care for them before we will ever reach them. Help us to be those peacemakers. Not just in this community and in our families, but to the world, to wherever it is we may travel, whatever it is we may do. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, folks, anything we need to say before we leave?